the first 11 verses. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. There's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that as we listen to your word, we hear your voice. We hear you speak. That we hear that wonderful good news of Jesus. And may indeed we be transformed by it. In your name. Amen. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is what we're going to be reading next week. I love that place where we come. Not that I have already obtained all this, but forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind. I hope I'm not wrong, but that's exactly the opposite of what I want to do right now. I want us to remember what lies behind. We'll come and understand what the Apostle Paul meant by that next week, forgetting what lies behind. But I want to take a few minutes and remember what lies behind us in our study so far of Philippians. We said one of the key verses, one of the key verses in Philippians is in chapter 1, verse 27, where the Apostle Paul says, whatever happens, when he says whatever happens, he's talking about whatever happens to me, whatever happens to myself, And throughout the book of Philippians, he's talking about himself in the sense that he is separated from the people, and he's not sure what's going to happen to him. He thinks that he's going to be released, but the people know that he has been arrested. They know that. They're not sure of the outcome of his trial, how that is going to go, but but they are absent from each other. They know that he cannot come to them. That's not going to happen. Whatever happens to me, whether I get released and I can come and visit you or I don't get released, in fact, if I get executed, whatever happens to me, conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel of Christ. And we said that word conduct is really, uh, it has a powerful meaning in the sense that it it has the idea of conduct yourself as, as citizens, live as worthy citizens. And these Philippian people who valued their citizenship so highly, he says, live as worthy citizens, not of Rome. Well, yes, of Rome, but more than that. Live as worthy citizens in the kingdom of God. Live out your faith. Live worthy of the kingdom of God. Well, what's that look like if you're going to live a life worthy of the calling you've received? What's that look like to live worthy? In one word... It looks like Jesus. And so he says, have this mind that Jesus had. Have this attitude that Jesus had. Live like Jesus. And we know that there's plenty of people around who are living out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. Don't be one of them. Follow Jesus. Follow in his steps and live as he lived. 
And then he goes on to say, and I want you to know it's possible. It's possible. The reason it's possible that you can do that is because you're not doing it on your own. The reason you're able to do that is because God is working in you. Because God is working in you, it's possible. And I've seen it. I've seen it. Timothy, Timothy who is here with me, T Timothy doesn't live like everybody else. He is so different. Everybody else looks after their own interests, but not Timothy. He has your welfare in mind, and he is one who is living like Jesus. And Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus, he's one of you. He's over here with me right now, but he's one of you. And, and he risked his life for the gospel. And he did this, and it shows that, that not everybody is living like everybody else, but these two men show that, that God is powerfully at work in people's lives. And so we're not only saved by God's grace, but we're transformed by God's grace so that we become the people he wants us to become. And he says, take a look at what's happening. It happens. It happens. I've seen it. I see it. And so that's what he talks about in those first couple chapters of Philippians. But then he turns the page over, so to speak, and it seems like he starts talking about something else, something additional. Now, the, uh, my Bible here this morning starts with the word further. Now, I had a different Bible for a whole lot of years, and that Bible I had a different word there. It said, finally, finally. Instead of further, it said, finally. But now the translators of the New International Version thought that they should change the word finally to the word further. And, and I think the reason they did that is because there's been this age-old problem, you know, of, of like ministers. We, we like to talk and talk and talk, you know. And then sometimes we'll get up there and we'll be talking and talking and then we'll say, and finally, but we don't mean it. We don't mean it at all. We don't mean finally. We don't mean that we're all done. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep going for quite a while. It seems like maybe they kind of thought that about the Apostle Paul. He's only halfway through his letter and he says, finally. And I think maybe it's better to say further, furthermore, or in addition to the things that I have already said. And then he says this, rejoice in the Lord. Now, it's interesting. He says that in verse 1, rejoice in the Lord. But then he doesn't talk about that. He doesn't explain that. He doesn't go on with that at all until chapter 4, verse 4. And then he returns to that theme and he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And so some people think the Apostle Paul is, is writing his letter. He says, finally, I've got one more thing to say. Oh, oh hold it. No, there's two. I think better than that is to look at this rejoicing is kind of like brackets, brackets around this thing that he's going to talk about. Finally, rejoice in the Lord. And as you continue to live out your faith, as you live out your calling, it's not always going to be easy. There are difficult things out there. But as you do it, never forget to rejoice. Rejoice isn't something that you feel. It's something that you do. It's to voice your thanksgiving. It's to sing praise. It's to lift God up for who he is and what he has done. Finally rejoice in the Lord always. But then he does seem to switch gears. And then in, he says this, watch out. He really says watch out three times. In our English text, you only see it once. He says watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Watch out for them. In our English text, it says at one time. But if you read the Greek text, it says, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evildoers. Watch out for those mutilators of the flesh. It's a command. It's an imperative. Be careful. Watch out. Now, first he says, watch out for the dogs. Now, he's not talking about three different groups here. He's talking about one group of people and expressing it three different ways. But he starts by saying, watch out for the those dogs. That doesn't sound like a compliment. Watch out for those dogs. A lot of us kind of like dogs, though. You know, some people say dogs are man's best friend or people's best friend. 
I kind of think that. If there's one animal on the face of the earth, I think it should be a dog. I think dogs are great. We have a dog that lives with us right now. It's not our dog, it's our son's dog, but she is just the sweetest thing. She's a golden retriever, and she, she, she's just trying to make everybody in the house happy all the time, and people who come over, she's trying to make them happy, and she walks right up to you. If she could talk, she'd say the sweetest things, but she just sticks her nose there and says hello her own way. She's a sweetheart. She really is. Sweet dog. Nice dog. Not all of you know this, but we used to have a different dog. We had him for 13 and a half years. His name was Mario. He looked like a golden retriever, but he was really a mutt. He was the nicest dog in the world. He was the best dog in the world. And that's a bold-faced lie. He was not the best dog in the world. He was a naughty dog. He knew how to get in trouble. I, I mean, he, he was nice to people, but he was a naughty dog. He, he created mischief. He got in trouble so many different times. I could tell you lots of stories. I wouldn't even have to preach a sermon this morning. I have so many stories I could tell about that crazy dog. I, I, I went to the video store one time. Uh, uh, remember when you used to go to the video store and rent videos? Remember that? You used to do that once upon a time. Anyway, I went there and they had a special and they had Marley and me. Would you like to rent it? I said, no way. I've lived it. I don't want to rent that. No. Anyway, I remember different times that I'd be up here preaching and Mario would be standing there at the church doors looking in at me. He'd be standing there looking into the church and I'd be looking. He'd say, let me in, let me in. I speak dog. I could understand that. He'd say, let me in. Well, he was a very spiritual dog, but he was very naughty. Now, lots of us think a dog is man's best friend and it's a very complimentary thing, but it's certainly not complimentary here. And Paul says, watch out for those dogs. Now, in some parts of the world, and some of you who have traveled have seen this, dogs are just scavengers. There are dogs that live out on the streets. They belong to no one. And, and in many parts of the world, that's how dogs are, some of the dogs at least are seen as these scavenger animals that you don't want any part of them. And Jewish people refer to Gentiles as dogs. They're dirty dogs. They don't belong. They're outsiders. And that's how they refer to Gentile people. They're dogs. And the Apostle Paul reverses that here. And he says, those who are evildoers, those who are false teachers, they are the dogs. They are the dogs. Now, what did these false teachers teach? He doesn't fully explain it right here, but you get the implication in that next verse where he says in verse 3, for it is we who are the circumcision. And you get the idea that these false teachers were saying, these people there, <laughs> they're not Christians. They're, they're, they're not true Christ people. They're unclean because, well, they haven't kept all the rules. A good summary text for what's most likely going on here and what happens in many New Testament communities is what you read in chapter 15 of the book of Acts. In chapter 15, verse 1 of the book of Acts, it said, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers... Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. There are these teachers out there, and they're teaching you that you need to be circumcised and keep the whole law of Moses in order to be saved. So don't tell us the stuff that you are saved by grace. You might need grace, but you also have to earn your salvation. You have to prove yourself to God. You have to do enough. You have to keep that entire law of Moses. And if you're not getting circumcised and following that, you are outsiders. And the Apostle Paul says, no. He says, we, you believers in Jesus, we are the circumcision of Christ. He is saying something astounding here. He really is. 
That's who you are. Now, it probably doesn't strike us too much that way. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Pastor Reverend Dr. Mopundi was here preaching. And when he was preaching, he said, uh, the text is this, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. That's who you are. Don't forget who you are. And he had to say, we are the salt of America. We are the light of America. Know who you are. That's who you are. Remember who you are. And just as emphatically, we can say, we are the circumcision. Now, you probably won't go around and say that, and I don't really highly recommend you walk around and say that. But what the Apostle Paul meant by that is this. We are the ones who belong. We are accepted by God. Many of us know it this way. I am not my own, but I belong, body and soul, to my faithful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are part of the family of God, and yes, you are included. You belong. That's who we are. Now, Paul says, I did it the other way, or I, I tried to do it the other way. I tried to do it the way that they're talking about, and, and you know what? That's failure. It has failure written all over it. If someone, if someone thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I am more circumcised on the eighth day. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the Pharisee, uh, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. I did it all. Nobody outdid me. Uh uh. If it comes to effort, I get an A for effort. If it comes to following that law, I did it better than anyone I know. But I consider it loss because all that stuff I did was pointing toward me and kept me from Jesus. Now, what I'm going to say next isn't true of all of you, but it's true of some of you. Increasingly, this is not the story of everybody who is at Cottonwood Church, and, and I'm thankful for that. That, that means our, our ministry is reaching out beyond people just, just like me, and I'm thankful for that. But for some of you, your story is a little bit like mine. Um, for some of you, you, you grew up in the church. I grew up in the church, and every time there was a church service, we were at it. My mom would take us kids and we would be at every worship service uh, whenever the church doors were open. We would be there. We would. We went to Sunday school. You never thought of skipping Sunday school. We went to youth group. Um, we went to those things. Many of us went to Christian schools and, and we went to all these things. We went to catechism every week, we, 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 at least through the school year. We did those things. We, we, and I'm glad. I'm glad that I was raised in a Christian home where I heard the good news of Jesus. I'm glad that I had those experiences. I'm, I'm grateful for that. I really am. But sometimes, sometimes unwittingly, something kind of sneaks in. Even though I'm sure, anytime we were at church and, and the minister preached, I'm sure he preached the gospel. I'm sure he preached the good news. And I'm sure in all the classes that we went, we heard the teaching of, of the Bible and what we were supposed to hear. But somehow, somehow, some of us started to take with us, here's a list of all the things that we have to do. And so we have to go to church and you check it off. We have to go to catechism and you check it off. We have to go to youth group and you check it off. And you start looking at those check marks. It's kind of a spiritual scoreboard. And you, and you take a look at it and say, yep, I'm doing everything I need to do. I'm doing everything I need to do. I'm doing all these things. And if I do all these things, that's where it's at. I know that they didn't teach it, but somehow it subtly slipped in there. If I do all these things, that means I'm a good Christian person. And some of us continue to carry that scoreboard with us throughout our lives. 
We keep checking off the boxes, went to church this week, read our Bible, did devotions, prayed, make a check mark, make a check mark, make a check mark. I've done those things. I've done everything I need to do. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't have a clue. You, you didn't get that stuff. But some of you know just what I'm talking about. And even though every time we gather, we are saved by grace, we start thinking it's merit-based, performance-based. I have to do this stuff to impress God. And we start having this list of things we got to do, got to do, got to do. And we start putting our trust in what we are doing. Now, I think that's disappearing. People aren't being raised like that and taught like that and living like that these days. It's disappearing. But for some of us, we're still checking off the boxes. And that's our faith, checking off the boxes. Checking off, I've done, I've done, I've done. Now, on the other hand, there are people who say, oh, God, that, that stuff's all silly. We're saved by grace and it doesn't matter what I do at all. And sometimes the people who have that attitude, I'm set free, I'm free, I don't have to do anything, don't, don't worry about I, Both are missing the mark. Because what really matters, what's really important, what, what matters? But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. What matters is knowing Jesus. What matters is knowing him. We can know tons about him and we can check off the boxes. We can talk about everything we've done and accomplished. But do we know Jesus? Have we met Jesus? We can talk about, oh, I don't worry about any of that stuff. I, you know, I, I was raised in the church and I don't worry about any of that stuff. And, but do you know Jesus? That's the question. That's what matters. I consider all this the Apostle Paul says is rubbish because I didn't know Jesus. I was doing all this stuff, but I was only looking at me. And I never came to know him. And that can happen. That can happen even to religious people. We can be very religious and go through all the motions and not know God. Now, knowing God is a lifetime adventure. And we want to get to know him better and better. But some of us haven't even come to a starting point. Some of us haven't come to that point where we've really stopped making this about checking boxes and doing stuff. We haven't come to the point where we're honest with God. And that's where we need to come, to that point, where we're honest with God and, and say to God, I need you. Jesus, I need you in my life. I don't want to just go through the motions. I don't want to check the boxes. I don't want to say, oh, I got it all together. I'm good just the way. We need to know you. We need you in our lives. So some of us maybe haven't even come to that starting point where we've been honest with God and open with God and, and turn to God. But maybe today's the starting point. Maybe it's the starting point for you today. Will you truly turn to him? He'll hear you. Let's turn to him together. Dear God, some of us here have gone through the motions. Yeah, we've attended church. We've learned lots of things. We know about the gospel. 
Some of us maybe have attended church and we haven't cared about anything we've heard. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Some of us here are deeply in love with you. And some of us don't know you at all. Lord God in heaven, we pray this morning that you'll enable all of us to open up our lives, our hearts to you. And say, Lord Jesus, we need you. We need you in our lives. We need you. Everything we do isn't enough, but your grace, Lord. We turn our hearts toward you. Dwell in us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.